Neil Katyal, let me begin with you and uh, the, the appeal uh, that, they, that the Justice Department has filed to the 11th Circuit to completely throw out the special master uh, in, in the documents case. What do you make of that? It's an incredibly powerful appeal, Lawrence. So remember, Trump asked for the special master, which no one normally gets. You and I would never get it. But drew this judge, Judge Cannon, who gave him a special master. She quickly got reversed on the notion that the most serious documents uh, that the Justice Department isolated, the ones with serious national security sensitivity, shouldn't be subject to this special master review. So the Court of Appeals rejected Trump's claims in two of those three judges were actually appointed by Donald Trump. Donald Trump then took part of that up to the Supreme Court, where he lost last week yet again. And the Supreme Court said these 100 documents aren't subject to special master review and the like. Now the department has taken a bigger appeal and said all the rest of Judge Cannon's order for the rest of the documents, roughly, I think, 19,000 pages or so, the special master shouldn't have been approached, shouldn't have been appointed for that. And that is a devastating appeal brief. It is as good a brief, Lawrence, as I've read. And, you know, Trump is now finally seeing after a Supreme Court loss last week that most judges don't take too kindly to poorly crafted legal arguments. And Trump is paying his lawyers a whole lot of money to be handed loss after loss in the courts. And when you look at his legal fees, like his business endeavors, Trump is seeing a rather poor return on his, on his investment. Uh, and Bradley Moss, uh, what will it matter to the way the criminal investigation is being undertaken right now? Because the Justice Department does have a free hand, thanks to the 11th Circuit, uh, to be investigating everything about the classified documents. They do not have to hand over the classified documents to the special master. Uh, so it seems like much of their investigation can go on uh, whether, you know, without regard to where this appeal stands now. Sure. So the non-classified records, the one that Donald Trump is saying were subject possibly to executive privilege, they're still relevant and material in the context of a criminal inquiry here. And the Justice Department lays this out pretty nicely in their brief because the extent to which the documents with classification markings were intermingled and intermixed with these various other records speaks to not only how much Donald Trump personally had access to them and was viewing them, the extent to which he was giving other ish, uh, individuals, such as these aides we've heard about, orders to move boxes, to reorganize documents. It speaks to his willful retention of the documents with the classification markings, showing it wasn't just a you know, document storage mistake, that he knew they were there, they were with all these other records, and he didn't care, and he kept concealing it from the government. Uh, Glenn Kirshner, let's go to the investigative part of the case that is now being uh, peeled away at uh, in press reports, Wall Street Journal now, adding two names. We, we got one name last week. Now, now there's two uh, of Trump staffers current uh, in his current employ uh, who are in some way have been contacted by the FBI. One of them has submitted to questioning. We repeated questioning. We know that there could be more. And it's a clear indication uh, that this investigation is moving, uh, no matter what's going on with the appeals. Yeah, and Lawrence, this is a target-rich environment for the prosecutors. When you see, we've seen the pictures of dozens of boxes on pallets. These, you know, these documents had to be boxed up by somebody. The boxes themselves had to be moved and transported. And can you imagine all of the people who were assisting Donald Trump in that endeavor? Um, and then once you get to Mar-a-Lago and now perhaps even Bedminster and Trump Tower, there are so many sort of hands on these boxes and potentially on these documents that, as I say, it's a target-rich environment for the prosecutors who are digging in and investigating, you know, who may have incriminating information and, importantly, how might these documents have compromised our national security. What for you was the most important difference that you identified tonight uh, between yourself, a former Republican, and Mike Lee, a current Republican, in this debate? Well, I would say just two things. Number one, Senator Lee is uh, he's somebody who embodies the politics of division and extremism that I think now plague our politics and now prevent us from 
uh, solving major problems that the country faces, whether it's inflation or high cost of health care or protecting our air and water. He just refuses to work with with you know, most senators to get things done. And, you know, he's even attacking Senator Romney, our other senator on cable television, rather than working with him to get uh, things done for Utah and for the country. I won't do that. I'll work across party lines as an independent uh, and certainly uh, we'll work closely with with our other senator here, Senator Romney. Uh, the other thing is, is that I think it's very clear between Senator Lee and I that I'm committed to defending the Constitution. I've sworn an oath as a young CIA officer to defend the Constitution and risked my life more times, frankly, than I can remember to fulfill that oath. Senator Lee did something very different. He took that oath as a senator and, and then tried to topple American democracy by recruiting fake electors and misleading tens of millions of Americans about the legitimacy of the 2020 election. And I do believe that that is one of the, if not the most egregious betrayals of the Constitution of any senator in quite some time. And so it's important that we hold them accountable. Uh, Senator Lee is one of those senators. He's not the first one I've seen uh, who carries a Constitution uh, pocket size around uh, in his pocket. Uh, That came up in tonight's debate. Let's take a look at that. It is a betrayal of the American Republic you were there to stand up for our, converse, uh, for our Constitution. But when the barbarians were at the gate, you were happy to let them in. There were people who behaved very badly on that day. I was not one of them. I was one of the people trying to dismantle this situation, trying to stop it from happening. Because I believe in this document... Senator Lee has been doing this thing with his pocket Constitution for the last several years. Senator Lee, it is not a prop. It is not a prop. Please. Senator Lee, the Constitution is not a prop for you to wave about and then when it's convenient for your pursuit of power to abandon without a thought. I have to say this, uh, this debate has uh, centered more uh, on what happened uh, on January 6th than any other Senate debate I have seen so far. Uh, is this still uh, a, 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 an area that Utah voters are concerned about? Well, it is. There are many other issues as well. But the the reality is, Lawrence, that and what I'm saying on the campaign trail and what I believe in my heart is that we cannot overcome any of the major challenges we face as a country if we don't have a system of self-government. You know, I served in the CIA for over a decade overseas undercover. I worked and lived in countries controlled by dictators. They don't solve problems for people. They're about empowering and enriching themselves. And we're at a crossroads as a nation. There's a movement in this country, and Senator Lee is a leader in it, that wants to dismantle American democracy. They've already tried. They will not stop. And we have to build a coalition of Republicans, Democrats, and independents to stand up to it. And that's what my campaign is doing. And that's why I invite everyone to join us at EvanMcMullen.com. We will only save our democracy if we can build a sustainable majority, a cross-partisan coalition of those who still believe in it. And Senator Lee is, is part of the effort to tear it down. And we're not going to lower inflation. We're not going to get, uh, we're not going to protect our air and water. We're not going to bring down health care prices and, and, and get affordable prescription drugs. We're not going to do any of that until we have a functioning system of self-government and so I, I bring those things together. I think they're related, those kitchen table issues that Utahns care so much about and the health of our system of self-government, which, by the way, they do also care about that. But I think it's important to bring those two things together because you can't separate them. Uh, you reminded uh, me and Mike Lee of something. Uh, it's, it's astonishing that there's been so much news in the last few years that we could forget something like this. He actually voted for you for president as an independent candidate in 2016 because he did not approve of Donald Trump then. That's how far he has come. That's right. Well, Senator Lee urged me to run against Trump in 2016. He called Trump on Trump to get out of the race after the Access Hollywood tape leaked. And then he voted for me on Election Day. But four years later, what did he do? He was willing to help Trump despite the will of the people having lost an election to try to stay in power. It would have spelled the end of the American Republic, but that's what Senator Lee was willing to do. And along the way, it's a, an issue that's important to, to many Utahns, to most Utahns, in fact. Senator Lee compared Donald Trump to a revered figure in the Book of Mormon known as Captain Moroni. And, and it just shows how far Senator Lee went. You know, he, he really has lost his way in Washington because he's one of these people there 
who are pursuing power at, at, at any cost. I mean, Senator Lee has proven that he will say anything and he will do anything in order to hold on to power. And, and we've got to hold these kinds of, of leaders accountable before we're unable to. The day that I could be completely student debt free, that means a lot for me. That would be a big weight off my shoulder. It means buying a home. Um, it can mean maybe focusing more on a business, just a lot. Today, President Biden made the official announcement of the launch of the student loan forgiveness process at studentaid.gov. The application process actually opened this weekend with more than 8 million people applying to receive up to $20,000 in relief of student debt already. Republican attorneys general and governors in seven states have filed lawsuits to block the student loan forgiveness plan completely. So the political lines are clearly drawn in this election. Democrats are trying to deliver and have delivered debt relief to 40 million people, and Republicans are trying to stop any of that help from getting to any of those 40 million people. This is a game changer for millions of Americans. We get moving. And it took an incredible amount of effort to get this website done in such a short time. Republican members of Congress and Republican governors are trying to do everything they can to deny this relief, even to their own constituents. As soon as I announced my administration's student debt plan, they started attacking it, saying all kinds of things. Their outrage is wrong and it's hypocritical. Our next guest began his career as an elementary school teacher, then became a school principal, then served as the commissioner of education in the state of Connecticut and is now President Biden's secretary of education. Joining us now is secretary of education, Miguel Cardona, thank you very much for joining us tonight. First of all, tell us exactly how to apply. 40 million people and all of their relatives are going to tell them to do this. Need to know exactly how to apply. Yeah, great. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, look, a simple process, less than five minutes. Go to studentaid.gov, submit your application there, and you're all set. And you're all set. 40 million people are eligible for debt relief, up to $20,000. We, we know that uh, about half of those 40 million that are eligible could have their loans totally uh, canceled, totally wiped out uh, with this action by the president. Uh, and we're excited to move forward with it. Do you, uh, what, what is the timetable on this? If someone is going to the website right now, which is uh, studentaid.gov, as I recall, if they're going to studentaid.gov right now and they fill out this application, they put in all their information about their loan, at, how long will it take for them to get a notice of how much has been forgiven? Right. Right. Well, I could tell you right now that if someone's on that website right now, before this interview is over, they could be done applying. They'll get confirmation instantly that their loan application has been submitted. And then we would go in the process of uh, ensuring that there's a match with a loan uh, because we want to make sure we're providing uh, loan relief for those who are uh, eligible um, and qualify and have a loan. Uh, and then the process will, will take over from there. Uh, we expect it to be fairly quickly, um, but the, the folks that are applying, their step is just to apply within five minutes. Uh, that's their job. And then we're going to communicate with them. Uh, the, the beauty of this is that we want to be very proactive here. We want to make the process simple. So we're going to be communicating updates to those who have applied, letting them know where they are in the process. So there are kids, when I do the math, there are kids who had you in class as their elementary school teacher mm -hmm. who are tonight applying for student debt relief uh, from their college uh, tuition bills with your guidance. What does that feel like for you to be personally delivering this help? Lawrence, it's a great feeling. There's a student who I had in my first year as a fourth grade teacher, Carla, who got back to me recently saying that she benefited from some of the borrower defense actions we've taken uh, as I was secre uh, as Secretary of Education. It's a great feeling knowing not only for the students that I've had, but for 
millions of Americans across the country who are looking at higher education as a pathway to prosperity to have some debt relief. Uh, so I'm excited about it. Uh, and, and I know there's so many stories out there. Last Friday, I was in Boston, and we were doing an event at a, at a school, uh, at a college. And um, I had one person literally dancing, sharing that she can finally consider buying a house now because of the debt relief that she's going to receive, that she's eligible for. This is game-changing. It's life-changing for these people. Um, it's going to change their abilities to move on and buy a home, start a business, as that video showed earlier. Uh, we're really excited about this.